Hello. Thank you so much for 1,000 subscribers. It really means a lot. Here's a list of some cool facts about Spyro Hero's Tale. I hope you enjoy. What is the maximum number of gems you can carry in this game? The developers never put a limit on the gem count, so it is instead limited by how it was stored. The player's gem count is a signed integer, which can range from about negative 2 billion to positive 2 billion. That's quite a lot. That number is actually so large that the UI element that displays the number fails to do so because its length exceeds its boundaries. For that reason, I'll display a separate count below that shows the full number. If you keep collecting gems, you will eventually reach its upper limit. If you collect any more, the value will overflow to the lower limit at around negative 2 billion. With this massive amount of newly acquired debt, you're naturally unable to purchase anything in the shop. The solution is easy though. Just collect around 2 billion more gems to get all the way back to zero and into the positive range, at which point everything will be back to normal. My personal best gem count for a 100% playthrough is around 142,000 gems. I think I can see why the devs didn't bother to limit this. In the tunnel leading to the level Molten Mount, there's a couple jaw snapper enemies and not much else. However, there is an extra enemy here, a hammer nork, that you can't see right around here. The reason you can't see it is because its spawn radius was accidentally set to zero. It's not completely hidden though. By walking directly over its position, you can get it to briefly spawn. Its hitbox immediately pushes you away again, so it despawns again very quickly. Despite the Nork spawning so briefly, we can actually defeat it by correctly timing our ice breath and a charge. This oversight was introduced within the last month or so of development, which we know because the prototype has the enemy functioning correctly. Pretty easy to see how this could have been overlooked during the crunch period. Let's say you defeat an egg thief and then don't collect the egg it drops. Then you save, quit the game, and reload the save. What do you think happens when you return to where the egg thief was? I think most people would assume that the egg thief either respawns or the egg spawns in some default location. In actuality, the game saves where the egg was dropped to the save file. When you defeat an egg thief, it doesn't despawn. Rather, it deactivates. This is because it controls spawning the egg where it goes and saving its state to the save file, so the thief must exist for the egg to exist. Only when you collect the egg does the thief despawn. When you quit and reload without collecting the egg, the game remembers that the thief has been defeated and where the egg should go. So when you walk inside its activation radius, it spawns in its defeated state and the egg is put in its proper location. A strange amount of thought went into handling this pretty inconsequential scenario. You've probably noticed that in some areas of the game, your character will have a snowy particle effect with their footsteps. It also seems to happen in some less appropriate locations, and in some snowy areas it doesn't happen. So how does the game determine when to make your footsteps snowy or not? Well, let's take a look at the code. In this simplified part of the function that handles footsteps, we see that the game checks if the player is on an icy surface or in an icy map, and if any of those are true, it assigns a snowy particle effect to the footstep. Simple enough. Let's see what the game considers an icy map. That function gets the map that the player is currently in. Then it returns true if the map is the first level of Realm 3. This is just returning true if you're in Frostbite Village and nothing else. Yep, that's it. You get snowy footsteps if you're in Frostbite Village or you're on ice. The icy map function was a very late addition to the game, as the prototype from a month before release did not have it. Seems they didn't quite finish implementing this feature. Did you know that Sergeant Bird does not have infinite missiles or bombs? He actually starts out with 9999 of each when you start one of his minigames. Here I've made a patch to the game that displays the amount the player has left. In practice, the player can never run out of ammo without the time running out. Even in the for fun mode of the speedways, the minigame eventually times you out after 30 minutes. But as you can see, if the player somehow manages to run out of missiles or bombs, they can indeed not fire anymore. The missiles and birds' wings also don't reappear. Sergeant Bird was originally supposed to collect ammo before he could use it, but this was dropped very early on in development. It seems that instead of making it infinite, they just bumped up the starting amount to a huge number and left it as such. I suspect some of the weird destructible bits of the first speedway level that served no purpose might be remnants from the ammo pickups. Who knows? On the topic of ammo, if you find yourself out of electric bombs or ice puzzles, 
Here's a neat trick you can use. I've added some additional text to the screen to make things clearer. Here I have 10 fire bombs and 0 ice bombs. If I stand still, select fire and hit the button to spit a fire bomb, but before the bomb actually spawns, I switch to ice. Spyro will spit out an ice bomb, even though I don't have any in my inventory. Not only that, my amount of fire bombs does not decrease, so I can do this infinitely. I can do the same with electric missiles, and you can use water instead of fire. However, if you do it the other way around, Spyro gets stuck in a glitched state like this until you attempt to spit again. What's happening here is that the game checked the currently selected breath and whether the player has ammo left for it, before letting Spyro spit. Since I have some fire bombs, it starts the animation. After Spyro is done with the windup, it checks the currently selected breath again to determine what type of ammo it should spawn, but at this point I've switched to the ice breath and it spawns an ice missile. It then tries to deduct one ammo from that breath, but since there is none of them left, it does nothing. Spitting ammo in first person works differently, so the trick can't be performed there. And if you try to do it while moving, Spyro's head gets stuck in an amusing animation until you interrupt it. So this trick only works when you're standing still. Spyro gets stuck if you attempt to do this while switching to fire and water, probably because these breaths can be charged to be launched farther, and this trick messes up that mechanic. But hey, this trick lets you use the two best breath ammos for practically free. This game uses big rectangular loading triggers, which handle loading and unloading a map when the player walks through them. This is a visualization script I made, which shows where the triggers are. The blue triggers are for loading maps, and the red triggers are for unloading maps. The spinning arrow is the direction the player must walk in to trigger them. In the building across the bridge that leads to Crocobot Swamp, there are two triggers. One to load the tunnel leading to the swamp, and another to unload it when you walk away from it. The developers didn't make these triggers wide enough to fill the whole room, however. If you just hug the left or right wall, you can walk right past them. If you do it on the way to the swamp, you'll see a black void where the tunnel would have loaded. If you do it the other way, the tunnel will stay loaded in the background, though this doesn't lead to any issues. Another blunder can be seen at the beginning of Dark Mine. Just like before, there's an unload trigger for the ravine with the moving platforms when walking away from it, and a load trigger to load the area when walking towards it. However, it seems these triggers were accidentally misaligned. The unload trigger still covers the whole hallway, but the load trigger is very easy to run past. So if you walk back this way, there's a high chance you'll miss the loading trigger for the ravine, and there'll be a black void in its place. It's easy to understand why the developers would have missed this, given that you never walk back this way, really. This is a very obscure little detail that players are very unlikely to notice. When you stand idle, the game can randomly choose to make Sparrow sleep. However, before making him sleep, it first checks what level the player is in. If they're in Frostbite Village or Ice Citadel, it will choose to keep him awake. Effectively, it's impossible for Sparrow to sleep in those levels. I'm guessing the developers did this because it would look silly for him to sleep in the freezing cold, but he seems just fine sleeping next to Molten Rock, so I can't be sure. Speaking of freezing cold, you likely already know that all the water in Realm 3 is very cold, and if you jump in, you freeze to death immediately. However, there's exactly one body of water outside this realm that is also freezing, and it's this one, in the tunnel leading to Ineptune. You wouldn't know this playing normally, because the water is too shallow to start swimming in, but if you use glitches to get out of bounds and enter the water further below, you can indeed see the water here is freezing. I'm guessing the developers did this in case the player somehow got out of bounds, but this is the only shallow body of water in the game with this property. Very strange. Very, very, very far out of bounds in Gloomy Glacier, three wall switches can be found. I'll use no clip to reach them. With some trickery, it's possible to hit them, and the game gives you a 15 second timer to do it. However, nothing happens when you hit them all. The switches are not linked to anything else in the level, and so these serve no function at all. And the last fun fact for today is that you are wonderful. Thank you so much for watching, and thank you for sticking around. See ya.